everyone. Welcome back to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. If you're new here, thanks so much for joining us. Here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it's all connected. Today we're talking about a super hot topic, although I kind of think it's maybe not as hot as it used to be, but still something we get asked about all the time in rheumatology, which is vitamin D. And something not everyone may know is that rheumatologists were actually really early on the vitamin D train, mainly because it's early recognition of its involvement with bone health, and we are bone and joint doctors after all. So we're going to be talking about vitamin D from the rheumatology point of view and talking about what we do know and what we don't know. So stick around. <laughs> the intro, vitamin D has been on the rheumatology radar for a while. It was acknowledged many years ago how important vitamin D was as far as bone health and as rheumatologists who take care of bone and joints, osteoporosis, osteopenia, we've been aware of this vitamin D and the need for vitamin D for a while. So what is vitamin D? It is a secosteroid, which means it's a hormone that is very involved in the development and metabolism of bones and also our immune health. You can find it in dairy and eggs and some oily fish as well as fortified foods, but in humans the main form of vitamin D is actually made in our skin. So there are two forms of vitamin D. You have D2, which is ergocalciferol, and D3, which is cholecalciferol. And D3 is the main active form within humans. So what happens is you start with the cholesterol, which is a compound that's found in the skin, and when exposed to UV light, gets converted to your first form of vitamin D3. That then will travel to the liver, and within the liver gets exposed to an enzyme that then converts it yet again to another form of D3. That then travels to the kidney where it has its final conversion by another enzyme and becomes the active form of D3. Now, this is the way I learned it when I was in training. That was a, a minute ago. <laughs> that was a few years ago. Since then, it has become clear that the kidney is not the only place that final step can happen. The particular enzyme that we thought was only in the kidneys that converts it that last time to the active D3, that enzyme is actually also found in immune system cells, which really opened up our eyes to the possibilities of vitamin D being more intimately involved in our immune reactions and inflammation than we previously recognized. So our ability to take vitamin D with UV light and can do all these conversions to get our active vitamin D is really influenced by a lot of factors. So one, if you have darker skin, you have less ability to absorb UV light and that can affect the ability to even start this conversion process. Age makes a difference. The use of sunscreen can make a difference. Where you live, so your geography, your exposure to sun, your latitude makes a difference. Also, as you heard, there are a lot of enzymes necessary to make these conversions. And genetic mutations within those enzymes can influence the enzyme's ability to do its job. And then ultimately, which we'll talk about later in the video, if, if you have a chronic medical condition, that can also really influence this process in ways that we don't quite understand yet. So because of all these variations in someone's ability to be able to convert to active vitamin D3, in many cases, taking a D supplement may be necessary. So when you have an adequate level of vitamin D, that active, adequate level of vitamin D finds its way into certain cells and it does this, it travels through the blood connected to various different proteins, it then attaches to a vitamin D specific receptor and in the cell turns on specific genes that would not be turned on 
in the absence of vitamin D. So we call those vitamin D dependent genes. And those genes are intimately involved in our bone metabolism and our ability to absorb calcium. We all know to make strong bones, we need calcium. But where do we get that calcium? Well, we get it from what we eat. And so we ingest the food, and how does that calcium get into our bloodstream? Well, it gets absorbed in our gut. But how does our gut know when and how much calcium to absorb? Well, it knows based on the level of vitamin D. So vitamin D is really important in really setting us up to optimally absorb the calcium we need to keep our bones healthy and strong. So when we have a less than optimal vitamin D, our ability to absorb calcium goes down as well. Low vitamin D leads to low calcium absorption, which then can lead to weaker bones, hence osteoporosis and osteopenia, and then sets us up for risks for fractures. So that's vitamin D and bone health. What about vitamin D in the immune system, and specifically autoimmunity? Well, there is some things that we know, but there is a lot that we don't. So let's start with what we know. So we know that those who have autoimmune conditions like MS, lupus, RA, myositis, type 1 diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, have a higher rate of having low vitamin D than the general population. So there's an association. But remember, association is not causation. Does vitamin, low vitamin D lead to the autoimmunity or is it simply a consequence of the autoimmunity? We don't have an answer for that. And a really good example of, of how confusing it can be, in people with lupus, we know that they are oftentimes very photosensitive, meaning that they're very sensitive to the sun. And the sun can not only cause rashes, but can cause lupus flares. So the general recommendation is to avoid UV light exposure. So in a lupus patient with low vitamin D, is it because of the lupus and the autoimmunity or is it because they're avoiding UV light? The other really compelling and intriguing discovery, as I mentioned earlier, was the discovery that that enzyme that makes that final conversion to the active vitamin D in the kidneys is also found in immune cells, which means that immune cells have the ability to take inactive vitamin D and make active vitamin D which opens up the, a world of possibilities of how these immune cells might then utilize vitamin D to modulate their activity. This ability to make their own active vitamin D3 seems to be involved in how cells mature, how the immune cells mature, how these immune cells activate, what chemicals they release in response to that activation, and that in turn has an effect on inflammation. Overall, the data that we have so far, which I'm gonna point out is in non-human studies, overall, this seems to point to vitamin D having a, an anti-inflammatory effect as it suppresses inflammation. But the exact mechanisms that it does this and what that means for the person as far as how they feel is yet to be determined. So there's a lot we don't know. Number one, what is the optimal level of vitamin D? If you've ever had your vitamin D checked, which if you're a rheumatology patient, you most likely have, you will see in your lab report that there's a reference range and anything over 32 is considered normal. Well, where did we get that number? That number is from the 90s, and it was found that that was the threshold where you saw changes in calcium absorption in the gut. So less than 32 is where you start to see a drop in your calcium absorption, and above 32, everything is being absorbed just fine. But you can see that it has nothing to do with immune cells or inflammation. It's all about whether or not you're absorbing calcium. So what is the optimal level for optimal immune health? We don't know. And I mentioned before that there are a lot of different factors that go into someone's ability to convert to active vitamin D3, um, their age, their medical conditions, as well as some genetic factors. So the 
idea that one blanket level is going to be optimal for everyone is probably inappropriate. And one person might do just fine at a level of 45, and another person might need a level, level closer to 80. But we just don't know enough yet to be able to make that distinction. Now, I know that vitamin D, there is a lot of information out there about vitamin D, and especially in the world of autoimmunity, with claims that certain levels of vitamin D can either treat or prevent autoimmune conditions. And unfortunately, there just isn't any reproducible data that supports that. We don't know what the right level is. We don't know what the effect on the person is. The other thing we don't know is how to optimally replace vitamin D. Do you need to take 10,000 units a day or only 200 units a day? Should you be taking D2 or D3? The recommendations you're getting from your provider are largely based on their personal experience and how they were trained and not necessarily on reproducible data. The good news is that it is very difficult to get to toxic levels of vitamin D, which are generally believed to be anywhere between 80 and 120. So even though I just said we don't quite know what the best way to supplement vitamin D, it's very hard to get to levels that will be dangerous. I can't believe I forgot to mention this, so I'm adding this post-production. One of the most important things to remember when taking vitamin D is how you take it. Vitamin D is absorbed best when it's taken with fats, so dietary fats which translates into you should take it when you are eating your biggest meal, whether that's lunch or dinner. So I know a lot of people take vitamin D first thing in the morning, and I guess that's better than nothing, but you're not getting the biggest bang for your buck. That's what we do when we don't know. What is my personal take on vitamin D? I'm very pro vitamin D. Very early on, I was an early adopter of vitamin D replacement and pretty aggressive at trying to get someone's vitamin D up and I say up vague on purpose, right? Because we don't know what the optimal level is. That's based on my personal experience. Those that have an autoimmune condition, I have found can have a rough time trying to get their vitamin D level even into the 40s. And in my mind, it comes down to the risk benefit ratio of this vitamin D supplement. The benefit is that it's cheap, it's well tolerated, very few side effects, if any, and like I said, the risk of getting to toxic levels is pretty low. Do I think that having an optimal vitamin D level will cure all medical conditions, including autoimmunity? Probably not, but I don't know. Do I think it's worth trying to optimize our vitamin D level while we also do all the other things we need to do to take care of someone's autoimmune condition? Absolutely. That's a rheumatologist's point of view on vitamin D. A little bit of history as to how we got here, some of the discoveries we've made that have really highlighted that there's a lot more we have to learn about vitamin D and the immune system in particular. I hope you found this interesting. I hope maybe it provides some clarification as to why your doctor said you need to take vitamin D and also some clarification as to you know what level you should or shouldn't aim for. I think a good question to ask your doctor is what their experience is as far as an optimal level for patients with your condition or in your situation. And if you haven't had your vitamin D checked or you don't know your level, I'd really encourage you to ask for those results or ask to get tested if you haven't already. If you like this, hit like, hit subscribe, share. As always, here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because it's all connected. Thanks and have a great day. We'll see you next time.